The Lord be with you. Good morning, everybody. Let me spend a moment welcoming our friends that are joining us on Facebook Live, wherever you are. Uh, we're You're welcome. You're worshiping with us at Hope Community United Methodist Church, located in Pasadena, Texas, about, about three blocks, I guess, uh, east of Preston Road and about a block and a half south of Spencer Highway. I have a few announcements to make, and for those of you that are watching online, these include you as well, if you're interested in them. Uh, we're going to be having an uh, annual chili cook fundraiser in, on March the 3rd, and uh, chili is available for 10 bucks. Uh, we'll be serving it from 11 to 1, and then from 5 to 7. All orders will be prepared to go, but if you want to get your to-go order and eat it here, that's okay. Uh, we're we're going to be fixing them that way. Uh, we're going to be having a silent auction, and that silent auction will take place all day long, so you can come by and pick up your chili and look around and see if there's some things that you might want. Next Sunday is uh, the last Sunday of the month. It happens to be a fifth Sunday, and so we're going to have uh, ham, uh, uh, spiral cut ham, and baked potato, or potato soup. And what we're asking is that if you want to stay for lunch, it's just a donation, whatever you want to pay. But we're asking you to think about what you might have spent if you went out to eat and spent that on your on your lunch. Uh, we'll be eating it here. We're going to use that money to pay our district apportionments, which is the, the share our church pays to help our district function. And uh, that amount is $976. I don't have any idea that we'll raise $976 at lunch, but if we do, it'll be a good day. Uh, so if you're out there somewhere, you're welcome to come to. Uh, check out our website at hopecommunityumc.org and you can get directions. I've also been asked by some of our online viewers how they can contribute to the ministries that we do here. And those, when I say ministries, I'm talking about the, the stuff we do to feed the, the homeless, that we uh, handed out coats and blankets and all that kind of stuff. And if you want to participate with us in that ministry, but you can't be here to do it, uh, you can text HCUMC to 206-859-859. 9405. I'll say that again. It's HCUMC to 206 859 9405. And I have one last message, and this one is really, I think, maybe as important as any of the others. Our new bishop, Bishop Cynthia uh, Harvey, is going to be at Pearland uh, to speak to all of us next Saturday at 1 o'clock. And so everybody from our district is invited to go. I would highly encourage you to go to get a sense of who our new bishop is and what the new directions will be in the time to come. Uh, all things being equal, she'll be your bishop longer than I'll be your preacher. <laughs> so it might be good to get to know her. Uh, the, uh, uh, the days of, of me being here are numbered, I guess. Uh, but God says all of our days are numbered, so I shouldn't worry about that. Uh, for those of you that ask about my health stuff, I don't know anything. Uh, I'm supposed to get a, a test scheduled soon. And then I guess everything depends on that. So just pray and hang in there. Uh, we'll be fine. Or we won't be. Either way, we'll be okay. Uh, AJ's not here today. And so you have the great, highly esteemed honor of having me leave the scene. And so you may want to get your earplugs out. and uh, Or maybe it's a good time for a nap. Whichever. Uh, but I'm going to ask Anne if she'll play something to warm our hearts and get us ready for worship. As you're able, would you stand as we sing together, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And when we get to the chorus, 
You know, that's the part that says, on across the solid, we're going to have just the ladies sing. We weren't going to have any music, no instrument, no, we're just going to hear you ladies sing. And then when we get to verse 3, we're going to hear us guys sing. There are maybe a few less guys here, but we're going to sing loud. It'll be okay. So you ready? Verse 2. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy hill, my anchor holds within the... Okay, ladies. Okay, go ahead, right, stop. Okay. We're going to all do it. That's a bad idea. Well, that was a good idea, but it was a bad outcome. Uh, so we'll, we'll, it's okay. So we're going to all do it together without the, without the thing. Get us started. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Verse 3. His oath is covenant and his blood to support me in the welling flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found. It is righteousness alone, all less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And you may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the ninth chapter of Isaiah. But there will be no gloom. Who, for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This time I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Let's pray. Gracious God, you come to us in all kinds of different ways. Sometimes in the ways we expect, and sometimes in the most unexpected, unlikely circumstances. So today we pray that as we contribute our gifts and our tithes and our offerings to you, you will direct us to use them to glorify your name in this community, through our ministries, and in the world. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Okay, we're going to sing this morning, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. I, I guess I'm going to have you stand if you're able. Uh, I don't know how you sing leaning sitting down. we got to stand up to lean, I think. Yeah. So as you're able to stand, and when we're leaning on the everlasting arms, it wouldn't be bad if you leaned a little bit. Okay. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. Join us in prayer, if you will. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, when we leave the world and we come into this place, we come to be closer to you. And we say we want to be closer to you until being closer to you leads us into places we didn't want to go. Until it leads us into pain and suffering and criticism. Because it's so much easier just to keep doing what we've always done. Today we pray for this church that as we gather together we find new ways to serve particularly this community. But we also come as individuals praying God to get us out of a rut. Rescue us from decisions we made so many years ago that continue to haunt us and follow us and trouble us. Help us to realize that your call on our lives is your call. Not the church's call. Not the preacher's call. Not the Methodist church's call. Not the United Methodist church's call. But it's your call, God. And as you're calling us, help us have ears to hear. Eyes to see. God, following you is scary. We hear the stories of what happened to the disciples that followed you. We know about the persecution of the church forever and ever, it seems. And gratefully, we live in a country where pretty much nobody cares what we do. But God, that's the problem. Nobody cares. So today, God, we ask for your not only your blessing, but we ask you to lead us into the future. Willing to take risks. Willing to make sacrifices. Willing to serve you with every ounce of our bodies and our souls. 
So when we're afraid, God, give us power. Build us up. Help us to be less worried on the immediate results and more worried about doing your kingdom work because, God, you know, we know that you told us the kingdom has come near. In many ways, our lives reflect more of the disciples than they do of Jesus. So we're willing to stand up and say, we'll follow you anywhere, anytime, Jesus. But then when it comes time, we don't. So forgive us. Strengthen us. Empower us to go into the new things of the future. Filled with your love and your mercy and grace. And the determination that you handed over to Peter when you said, upon you, I will build this church. Upon each of us, he will build the kingdom. We're thankful for the teachings of Jesus Christ. We know He really lived. We know He was really persecuted and killed. And we know He really rose on the third day. It's with that spirit that we pray the prayer He taught us when He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth the way as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear from the Gospel of Matthew this morning, we're going to sing, Surely the Presence of the Lord. We're going to sing it through twice. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the brush of angel wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Would you stand? standing for the reading of the gospel. This morning I'm reading from the gospel of Matthew. It's in the fourth chapter. It begins in the twelfth verse. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. Many, many years ago now, when I was in seminary, I got a scholarship from the Order of the Eastern Star called the Estoral Scholarship. I was invited to preach at their grand, uh, whatever they, what, help me out, what do you call it? Grand Chapel. 
Now they didn't, they told me a seven minute sermon. Y'all know I don't do those. Uh, they invited me to preach a seven minute sermon. They didn't tell me what it was going to be. It was the last thing on the agenda for the, like the last night. And so I got up there to preach and, and I had prepared and I'd been to that three years before. None of the preachers before me ever did seven minutes. But these people, a lot of them, it was 10 o'clock at night, a lot of them have been up for a long time. So I promised them seven minutes. But I had to start off with, they were using an older version of the Bible which said fish for men. And I said, yeah, if we translate that nowadays, what that says in Greek is people. Now, how many people in here go fishing? Anybody go fishing? How many of you go catching? It's not the same thing, is it? Jesus doesn't promise that we're going to catch it. He says we're going to go fishing. We're going to go fish for people. Now, here's the problem with that. When you go on a fishing trip, how many fish do you catch if you don't take a pole? How many do you catch if you don't take any bait? How many do you catch if you don't make any effort on your part? Or, what about if you're fishing in this place, and the last place you fish, they use yellow lures. This one likes blue ones. If you only bring yellow ones, you're not going to catch any fish. You see, fishing is complicated. And I'm not very good at it. But so is fishing for people. In other words, we have to prepare. So as someone wisely said today, we've got to read God's Word. We've got to kind of know what it says. We've got to be in a community of people that are moving in that direction. And that's about when, when the preacher tells that to the church, you hear the church say, we've already tried that. Or we've never done it that way before. Or, or we can't risk it. Well, let me tell you, we're, we're making decisions every day based on things we did a long time ago. Some of us have new knees and I got a messed up knee and mine didn't get to be a new one. Some of us have had various surgeries. Some of us have got bypasses and all of that kind of stuff. You know, most of that is a consequence of what we did a long time ago. We are living with how we were instead of what we can be. And I mean that all of us. Me too. So how do we get out of that rug? Are we willing to risk it for God? Because we're sure not willing to risk it for ourselves. I worked at Olin Chemical when it used to own the refinery out here, I mean the fertilizer plant. I went to work there because my dear old dad worked for Olin in the sales office and he knew the plant manager and he got me a job out there in the summer. They didn't care if I stayed forever. They, it was a job. And I went to work out there in the labor pool and be there at 7 in the morning and that big mean foreman would come out there and tell me to move this over there and pick up cigarette butts and do all this other stuff. It took me about two weeks of being worn at slab out to realize that job wasn't for me. So I'm walking by the bid board and it says, oh, we got dock helpers. And they made more money. And they didn't work as hard either. And you got a shift differential. Now, I'm a single kid at home from college. Hey, let me tell you, long changes and shift differential and evenings and midnight, it was okay with me. I got to do a lot of different stuff. But you know what it got to be at the end of the summer? I just realized that it, was, it wasn't my job. And so I, over my years, have been kind of a risk taker. Sometimes it's worked out really good, and other times I went really broke. But God is calling us to look at our lives and say, where do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? And I wonder how many of us, if we'd have done that when we were in our 20s, or if we're in our 20s, how many of us would say... God, tell me what to do. You see, I wasn't that guy. How about you? I was looking for the easiest path to no resistance. So, I'm in college. My major is elementary ed. Because my mother was an elementary ed major. And my mother, she was a motivator in that regard. She said, now if you'll go be an elementary ed teacher, men 
move up really quick in elementary ed. They're always looking for a man to be the principal or a man to do this, do that. There's very few men, lots of women. It is a fertile field for you to be advanced. Sound okay? Until I went home after my first year on scholastic probation, failing. So, I got into a fight with my parents. Uh, I was home for the summer. You know, I'm, I'm a college student now. Uh, but they have rules. And you have to be in by 10. And, and, no, I didn't have to do that at school. Why do I have to do it here? So I got mad. And I got in my car. I drove up to San Marcos. Went to the administration building. And I said, what can I do that will permit me to go to college and I don't need mom and dad's money? And they said, well, you can major in law enforcement. Ah, okay, that sounds good. So I signed all the papers. They paid my tuition and books. Four years of college, graduated, degree in law enforcement. Went to work as a policeman. Great job. Boring. Boring. Ride around a squad car all day long. Boring. So I realized that wasn't for me either. So I quit that job and started selling farm equipment. Commission only. Going to make lots of money. Well, until one year, when I made $92 in January. But there's something about me that God has allowed me to escape the doldrums of a boring life and use me to do good for God in mysterious ways, and I don't think He's done. How about you? Now, I don't know what that means. I was telling him in Sunday school a while ago, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling with this whole cancer thing. I know y'all know it. We're struggling with it. I mean, i got to get these tests run. We'll find out. I'm not happy about what it would be like to be useless. So I, I try to take that. I don't want you to feel sorry for me at all. I, I try to take that into our lives and say, how many of us have a trajectory of anything more than the same old thing. How many of us are stuck in that place? Well, I got to be here because I was there. You know, A, B follows A, C follows B. Well, I'm really one of those people who think you can't go from A to H. Amen. You can go from H to Q. If you're willing to follow God and pay the consequences. I love this passage because these two guys are hanging out and they follow Jesus. And the other two guys want to follow him too and so they say bye. I guess they say bye to dad. He's there fixing his nets in the boat. Did you ever think about what they gave up? They gave up security. They gave up a lifetime of work. They gave up a lifetime of experience to go do something new. Do you think the father, we don't, he doesn't they don't say anything about the dad here except his name. How do you think he felt that day that his two boys walked off to follow this stranger named Jesus? And, and the reason I say that is I don't think we easily move into the future with Jesus Christ without some pain, suffering, and, and trouble. We absolutely need to say bye to some old ways. And they're going to be calling on us to stay. Keep doing it like you've always done it. It's safer. Which is why church attendance everywhere is down. Jesus doesn't call us to be safe. He calls us to do what He needs us to do in His kingdom. And this passage, you know, Jesus begins to preach, repent and believe the kingdom has come near. This is contrary to my teaching growing up. I thought it was kind of like Santa Claus. If you were good, you get to heaven. But if I read this right, what Jesus is saying, the kingdom is here. Near. Right here. And what are we doing about it? People still hungry in our neighborhood? Yep. People still struggling with health insurance? Everybody I know is. People still struggling with other things in their life? Everybody I know has some struggle somewhere. Either our kids don't call us as often as we'd like, or we don't call our kids as often as they'd like. Whatever it is. We've got struggles. 
Well, why do we allow those struggles to keep us from doing what God calls us to do? And how can we ever come to believe that it doesn't... It, Trust me, most of the call you're ever going to get is not going to come from the guy standing up here in a row in front of the church. I'm not the guy. Y'all all know JT. JT called me the other day because the Corinthians passage we didn't read this morning, it says uh, Paul is talking about baptism. And, uh, and JT called me up. He said, did you read that passage? I said, yeah, I read it a lot of times, JT. And he said, well, it, it says in there that people were in, in Corinthian, in Corinth, people were going out saying, I got baptized by somebody, and I got baptized by somebody else, and I got baptized by somebody else, as if who baptizes you is important. Let me explain baptism. I have nothing to do with it except to be an instrument of God when we do baptism. It's God's deal. How many times in our lives have God had that kind of an impact? We pay attention to it at all. When I went to seminary, the cost was five hundred dollars a semester. Hour is four hundred. I mean, one hundred eighty-five hours requires forty-five thousand dollars. I didn't have it. By the scholarships and the grace of God, I ended up three and a half years later graduating with no debt. What's God done in your life? What opportunities has God offered to you that seem complicated and confused and scary, but they're real? How many times have we looked at him and said, well, I wish it could be that. So let me share this one with you. In 1988, uh, Dr. Jim Killen was my pastor. He told me, he's the first one to ever tell me in the church, you're called to be a preacher. Okay. Go over and see the district superintendent. Went over there. <laughs> it was Asbury Lennox. What a wonderful man he was. I, now, I knew him much later after that. He had his desk in some, such a way that whoever was visiting with Asbury, it'd be like this. I was sitting down here like this, <clears throat> looking way up at him. And he said, just keep doing what you're doing. It'll be all right. <laughs> you OCD people aren't like that. So I got back to the church and I said, wait, he said, what did he say? I said, he just said, keep doing what I'm doing. He said, well, it's not a big deal. He said, they're going to send you to seminary. I said, okay. He said, you're going to go live in a little town like Ferguson or Edom. You'll be appointed their pastor and then you'll drive into Dallas every day. You go to class, you'll drive back. And I said, I got a six and an eight year old kid. How am I going to do that? I mean, this whole deal was set up to have a wife that never worked. I didn't even have a wife. So about that time, Baywood Hospital came off, offered me a job with a lot more money and I kind of put it on the back burner. It didn't go away. It just went away. I didn't do it because it was inconvenient. I didn't do it because I couldn't forecast the outcome. How about us? Do we ever make decisions based on that? It might be risky. It might be painful. It might hurt a little bit. I've made plenty. How about you? Plenty. I remember calling my dad and told him I bought a new car when I got that job at Baywood Hospital. He said, huh? You bought a car already? How long is probation? I said, 90 days. Don't you think you should wait till the 90 days is up? Those kind of thoughts have never entered in my mind. I didn't figure I'd be bad at it. I just figured it'd be okay. And then here's my dad trying to be helpful and kind and offered me, be careful. Hang on, you, 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 and I am today, to this day, fiscally, money-wise, I'm pretty darn conservative. Socially, I'm probably more liberal than some of y'all. Not that anybody doesn't care about homeless people and hurting people, I know that. We just have different ideas of solutions. And one of the things that hurts me so much about our world right this minute is that so many of us say, well, if you're not going to do it my way, I'm not going to do it at all. I don't know what the way is, friends. I, I don't know what the future bears for Hope Community United Methodist Church. I don't even know what the future bears for me. I certainly can't know it for you. But I know there's going to be a future. And I'd sure like to be on God's team when that future comes. How about you? And I know it's coming. Because today's going to be over in a little while. Maybe the Cowboys will even win. 
And tomorrow we get a new day and a new opportunity and new opportunities arise. How are we going to deal with that? And I've got to tell you, friends, you've got to deal with it first. Each one of us has to individually do that. Are we willing to risk stuff for God? Are we willing to risk it for our church? Are we willing to risk it in our own lives? Because if we're not risk takers, we're nothing like Jesus. He was a risk taker. And they thought they had him. And they killed him. And three days later, the tomb's empty. You don't think it's possible? God can do it. You don't think we can be a part of that? God can do it. You don't think you can do it? God can do it. And part of the problem is we don't rely enough on God. We don't listen to God's voice. We don't listen to what God's teaching us. We would rather it match up with exactly what we want it to do. And then we're happy to serve. Now I'm not really talking to y'all individually here. It's, it's, it's just in pointing people out. I, and Ron always talks about that preacher that said, isn't that right, brother? So, no, I'm not going to do that. But what I am saying is that the reason the church has declining attendance, the reason that because we have left the real world and gone into a place where if they'll just come to us, we'll offer them Christ. But let me tell you, there may be enough people like us to fill this building in the neighborhood. Well, what if they don't look like us? Are we going to continue to, to judge people? And, and I know we don't do it much here, but we still do it. Are we going to judge people on their socioeconomic class or whether they're on probation or they've been to prison? Are we going to love them? Because I believe in a redeeming God that can redeem anything. How about you? I believe God loves everybody. Not just the Methodists. And, and what really irritates me is that the Methodists and the Baptists and everybody else, the Lutherans, Catholics, they all believe the tomb's empty. They all have the same call. Go out and make disciples in all the world. But why are we so afraid to do it together? Are we afraid that well, if you guys go over and visit Asbury, you're going to like their preacher better than me, and so you're going to stay there? Is that what we're afraid of? Or maybe that's what they're afraid of. That was anybody over here. I don't know. I just pick Asbury because they're a sister church. But, I, 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 you know, Golden Acres Baptist is gone. It's now called New Day. I talked to a former member of Golden Acres Baptist. There are almost none of the old people going there. Where are they? Do they know there's a church in their community that worships pretty much like they did? That preaches pretty much like they did? That offers Christ pretty much like they did? I mean, for some of these people who have been 50-year members of that church, where do they go to church now? Are we finding out? Are we asking? Are we inquiring? Are we letting them know that they're welcome here? We got friends that went to United Methodist churches that disaffiliated. Do they know they're welcome here? You see, I think God loves everybody. I know that I don't love everybody, but I'm supposed to. I'm quick to judge. Quick to give up. So maybe that's part of the lesson for me in the fight I get to have with cancer is not to give up. Fight back. Maybe in other things going on in the world, maybe that's all of our choices. We get to fight back. The world doesn't have to know, not know who Jesus is. The world doesn't have to have declining church attendance. It doesn't have to because God doesn't want that. It's because we haven't helped Him get it done. What are we going to do? And, and you know, it doesn't ever happen. I'd love to tell you, we make this decision today, we say, oh yeah, I'm on board, preacher, and we snap our fingers and be great next week. It doesn't work that way. It's going to take a while for us to figure out how to use our building in efficient ways because the building was designed in the 50s and nobody does church like they did in the 50s. We're going to have to figure it out. We're going to have to figure out ways. We, we, we're getting there. We made some decisions. We have another super cold night. We're going to open up the fellowship hall as a warming station. 
I, I already the, the police guy that deals with the homeless people has already been by the church. I didn't get to meet him, but Ron did. We're going to work with them. We're going to figure out ways to be there for people. We're going to start to do that stuff because I believe that grassroots movement is what will change the world. How about you? You believe that? It worked for Wesley. He went out to the mine and voted and preached to the miners. He went out there. The miners that were working in the mines were the lowest of the low in England at that time. And the mining owners were the richest of the rich. And they saw the workers as nothing but, but property. And John went out there at the encouragement of George Whitfield and he started to preach and tell them, you have value, as much value as the mine owner. And it was shocking. Do you think these guys and girls riding their bike down here think they have value? I don't know. But couldn't we tell them they do? You know, when, when it gets to be summer, we could sit out there and hand out water and talk to them because there's a pretty steady strain coming through. That's what God's putting right on our front step. What are we going to do? When are we going to do it? So I want to tell you, next week we're having ham and potato soup after church. I think it includes anybody. If you've got a friend or somebody that you don't know, somebody that you do know or don't know that doesn't know what church is about, tell them to come. They don't even have to come for worship. They get here at noon. Because somehow we've got to convince them that the regular imperfect people that go to the imperfect church that has the imperfect pastor love them too. I believe, I really do believe that when we start to convey that message where we're willing to take the risk when we can get it accomplished when we can follow through on what we said we were going to do when we can mean what we said. Because I want to tell you there's been a bunch of them out there they've told a lot of stuff. And it never happened for them. I told you about Ray that I met the pumpkin patch. He said, I pray on my knees every night. And I'm still living in my car. Well, okay, Ray, get a job too. Find a way to do something different. You, got, you can't stay doing what you've always done and see all of God's blessings. It can't happen. It never happened for me and I don't think it's done yet. How about you? So I'm encouraged by this passage about being that dad just sitting there in the boat. Guy walks by and calls his two workers to come with him. They get up and go. They give up their traditions, the things they've learned to do, their, their livelihood, and they follow. And, and I just don't know why we don't get to hear what dad thinks. Because I can tell you what my mother told me when I told her I was going to the ministry. You don't want to do that. They don't make any money. I love my mother, but that was exactly what she said. She had a, it was it was it was categorized in socioeconomic levels. Dr. Muzan Biggs, who was my favorite preacher of all time and friend, both of his doctorate degrees were honorary. An honorary degree simply means that somebody gave it to you. You see him on TV now and then. Every time my mother would talk about him, Dr. Biggs, but his degrees are honorary. He didn't earn them. You know, that primary process, that stuff you grow up with, it, it takes a long time to get rid of it. It takes a long time to leave that stuff behind. It didn't take these two guys any time. They got out of the boat and went. They could have said, well, wait a minute, Dad. You need us to stay. How, how, how will we be able to provide? But they trusted God. And they went. They believed. My friend, my question to you is, do you believe? Do you believe that God's calling us? That it's worth the risk? that God can always make it work. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I've got to go be this person now. So as we close our service today, we're going to sing freely, freely.
number is it in? 389. Okay, thank you. I took my notes from you. You know, I always tell you you need to pay attention to the words. As you're able, would, can, would you please stand? Let's sing. It's called Freely Free. I'm almost ready. Okay. God has gave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, today. We're letting you out a little bit early. Uh, we do that sometimes. Maybe it was a seven minute sermon today. You never know. Uh, we're grateful for your attendance with us and we're glad you were here. It means a lot to know. We'll get to see those numbers later. It's always surprising. For those of you that are in the room, God's calling us. I wish I could tell you what he's calling us to do and when. I, I wish I could tell you what the risks are and how much it's going to cost and how it will change. I can't. Some of it is likely to be painful. Some of it may create some suffering for us as we struggle through. Probably God wants a church on this corner. I don't think we're going to go away. I think God wants me to serve Him, and I think God wants you to serve Him. So as we remember that God created all this stuff, it must have had a purpose. Jesus taught us how to love and show mercy and grace. Maybe we should do it. And we're promised that the Holy Spirit will give us the power to offer Christ wherever we go. So friends, go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.